Sorry. Hello, everyone. Konnichiwa. Can you, can you all hear me well? Yes. It's Spade Clary. Ah, thank you. See, lovely set of people. So I'm so glad to be here for the second time here in Tokyo. Um, I think everyone feels um, just the same like me. That whenever you come to Tokyo, it just feels like you want to come more and more again, especially given it's the cherry blossom time. It feels so awesome to be here. And thank you for being here in my session. Um, you already um, are one of those good souls who want to make a web uh, for a better place for people with disabilities. So once again, welcome you all. Um, today's session is testing for inclusive web. A uh, bit of a story behind why the specific talk in this conference. So when Nozomi uh, did a survey um, on what is one of the topics that people definitely want to uh, listen, so it's, it's you, the Japanese folks, voted accessibility is one thing that you would want to listen uh, as, uh, it came in as number one, so I was really glad to see that. Uh, and I'm here, accessibility testing. Um, Manoj Kumar, that's my name, and I'm one of the uh, Selenium contributors, committers, uh, organize conferences, um, do bits and pieces of code, code uh, contributions to Docker Selenium, Protractor, uh, Serenity, and different projects, uh, if, if you heard them, and, and, and I'm sure you use that at some point on the stage. And I work at Apple Tools um, as a, a technical lead for APAC. Um, and I can see my colleagues sitting in the front row, so excited, just like me. Um, so let's get started. Um, so this piece here might be like a Greek and Latin, just like me, for everyone out here, um, if you're not Japanese. So that's accessibility and agenda written in Japanese. Nothing big, nothing you're losing out. Um, so the agenda looks like this. It's going to be in a four quadrants. Um, basically, uh, the first part will be looking at a short primer about accessibility, what it's all about, and what do you need to know about accessibility. And moving on to standards, what are the different standards that has been followed for accessibility and what are the things that you should definitely know if you want to know about accessibility. And next is uh, A11Y testing tools, um, getting into the technical aspect, some of the code samples and demo. And then moving on um, A11Y implementation strategy with uh, some practical uh, takeaways for the implementation. I just realized the translation is going on. I have to slow down a bit. Sorry. <laughs> there, there's a thumbs up. Cool. Thank you. All right. So throughout this talk, there'll be uh, uh, different acronyms that I'll be using, which, which all refers to the same thing, which is nothing but accessibility, which is called A11Y or A11Y or Ali. So if you're wondering or seen somewhere what is Ali, but you're not quite sure what it's all about, so if you have A and Y, but remove all the alphabets in between and number them with one, you'll see 11 characters in between A and Y, and hence the name Ali. And it can be, it's basically, you know, um, uh, discovered to use it in a, in a better um, way when you tweet about it or use it in a different platform. A short primer, let's kick in. Accessibility is about enabling people. Um, it's all about um, inclusiveness, so when we mean inclusive, it's not that um, uh, we do things, um, a healthy person can do things that they can, like walking up the stairs or uh, uh, using a product, but how about people uh, who have some sort of disabilities and impairments, and are we thinking about them, including uh, things that we do? So, disability only exists if we don't provide them a way. And people have impairments and not disability. So emphasizing the fact here, um, so disability is something that, yes, it happened. Uh, it could be permanent. So I have a few set of slides uh, back there to show you what, what is it all about. Is it permanent, um, uh, temporary, or situational? But um, to um, see some um, uh, examples, um, again, from an environmental perspective, uh, just to summarize again, accessibility is nothing but design principles that you should follow, be it you design a product, um, a software, uh, or, or be it in, in an IT field, or be it somewhere uh, in an environment just like this, right? So if you see this picture, there's a man uh, walking up the stairs, which is perfectly fine, and there's, you can actually see a man with a wheelchair. So we can actually see there's no way for him to get up to the stairs. And it's, it's not his fault. 
and it's completely uh, our fault because we don't find a way for him to be include, be more inclusive within the society. Yes? And that shows in the next slide. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? So this is a picture taken from uh, uh, in, uh, somewhere in Canada, I believe, where this is actually called stramps, where you can actually see steps as well as ramps. And, and imagine this person here will actually have no problems climbing up the stairs in here. So that's how we should you know, try to find um, ways to be more inclusive, uh, to include those people in our day-to-day -day life. And this one, so, so this is nothing but just to give a snowflake effect after Simon's keynote yesterday. Uh, I was trying to find um, a picture that depicts uh, something about snowflakes and also about accessibility. So, uh, and also uh, giving a core message here, which says here, so there's a man in the wheelchair and there's a couple of kids waiting to get up the stairs, but unfortunately there is uh, quite a bit of snow and, and, and they're waiting for the man to do. So just to read out, uh, could you please show the ramp, says the wheelchair man. And also the kids say, uh, oh, sorry, the, the man who, who clears that up says, all these other kids are waiting and when I do for them, and I'll get on to you, right? But if you see, actually, that the, the person in the wheelchair says, but if you show all the ramp, we all can get in. That's the core message, right? And that's in the top here. Clearing a path for people with special needs, clear the paths for everyone. And again, just summarizing the fact that I told earlier, disability is not only about physical condition, it's about limited human interaction. And we need to find a way to have this limited human interaction uh, to be included in, in our day-to-day -day life. So now that we saw what accessibility is and you know, giving an example more from an environment perspective, how this ties down to web, um, where we all belong to. Um, in this digital age, everyone knows that um, everything's on, on, is, is on the mobile and go. Uh, can you even see banks that are going only digital, only banks? There's no physical locations. So you should definitely think about those people who have some sort of disability or impairments to, to be specific, uh, which boils down to be around 20% um, uh, of the world's population, which boils down to be exactly 1 billion in number. So, um, and it's all about web, right? So consider a, a bank, which is digital only, does uh, ways to do banking in mobile apps or web applications. And if they make ways that are not accessible, there's no way the people with disability will be able to use any of those services. So if your app isn't accessible, you're creating barriers and making their impairment a disability. Hence the distinction between an impairment and disability. So, uh, next few set of slides is going to be uh, from a developer perspective. Um, say, we saw what web accessibility is, and in order to develop uh, an application that is web accessible, there are a few principles that you should follow, and that's exactly what we're going to see. Uh, this picture depicts nothing but a sake being poured into a traditional um, a Japanese cup, which is called pour. So the design principles for web accessibility is nothing but pour, P-O-U-R. P stands for perceivable, where you need to uh, make distinction between what is, what is on the foreground and the background, and making, making sure the UI that you develop as a developer um, has a, a better distinction between what is behind the screens and what is being presented as a UI. O stands for operable. Um, you need to definitely have the UI controls that is operatable, uh, not only for specific devices, say mouse only. So that could be different situations, uh, even like you and me, having, say, a cup of coffee in hand and trying to you know, work around things in keyboard. I'm, I'm sure many of you have done that. And sometimes if the UI is not you know, uh, having that keyboard focus enabled, then definitely you have some problems with it. And, 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 and that's, that's the operable factor. And then uh, U stands for understandable, um, definitely. UI is the face of your application. Make sure um, it is simple and it's not complex and that everyone understands. And next comes R, that stands for robust. Um, yes, we develop UI, but it needs to be more in an understandable way um, in which uh, the assistive technologies can still understand uh, what can be uh, read back to people who have uh, some of the auditory impairments, right? 
So when I speak about auditory impairments, there could be people who has, uh, say, uh, who are deaf, uh, who can hear with only one ear, or that is like permanent uh, disability that I'm talking about. If you have to take about situational, uh, how about using an application in, in a bar which is very, very uh, in, a, in a noisy environment, right? So that boils down to, again, uh, having a robust application, which is not dependent on any, any of those external factors, but still provide your uh, information in a more accessible way. Now, given these principles, how, as a developer, I would boil down to um, have this information what I'm, that I'm going to present in a more accessible way? Of course, we know about HTML and DOM, right? Everyone knows about HTML and DOM? Yes? Yes, it's quite easy. Now, how to have these accessible information available? It's nothing but ARIA attributes. So ARIA attributes are nothing but it communicates a role straight property and semantics to assistive devices. So when I mean assistive devices, it's nothing but any technology that helps people with a vision impairment, like say colorblind or people who has no vision at all, but still be able to use applications just like we do. And there's nothing but screen readers. How many of you heard about screen readers before? Your hands, that's good. Um, so as a developer, um, say there is a checkbox. So imagine there is a checkbox in a, in a web page, right? So how, how a, a person with uh, no vision at all would know there is a checkbox which is enabled or not? And he uses a screen reader. And when the screen reader says, hey, there is a checkbox, and will the screen reader will actually say whether it's being checked or not, right? And how the screen reader interprets those information is nothing but the information that we give in the HTML DOM, which looks like this. Are your checked is equal to true? So when these attributes change from false to true, that's when the assistive devices say that, yes, the checkbox has been clicked. And if this is false, simple, it's not clicked. And ARIA is not always needed. Um, because these ARIA attributes, there is a total misconception about these ARIA attributes in, in, in whole because they see this as a band-aid for applications that are not accessible. I've been working with different um, insurance companies back in Australia where I've seen um, UI developers um, developing fancy uh, React applications and, and using these ARIA attributes as a band-aid to uh, fix those errors. But again, the core message here is Embrace accessibility. Be more inclusive about what you're developing. Be passionate about what you're developing. And these ARIA attributes is not a band-aid for your accessibility errors. It's just a more of your ways to help you fix those problems. And again, it's not needed in all situations. If, you, if, if your application uh, has things that calls uh, native browser elements, it'll automatically pick up and say those elements. You don't need an ARIA attribute for that. So we spoke about DOM. Um, since we're all Selenium testers out here who have done automation for a very long time, we know what DOM is, right? Document object model. Uh, there's something called AOM, which is called um, uh, accessibility object model. Anyone heard about it before? Perfect. I'm so glad you're here. Right? So it's nothing but accessibility object model, uh, which is going to be in parallel with, with the DOM object. Um, as you see, it's a proposed JavaScript API to modify um, and explore the web accessibility tree. And there's, there's a, a, a group of people who does that. That's exactly like the WebDriver spec, right? So you all know we have a WebDriver spec where the browser vendors from different uh, companies, like Mozilla, we have David Burns, and we have Microsoft, and Brian Berg from uh, Apple, who, who looks after Safari. And of course, there is Simon, who, who, leads, who leads all this, all this spec. And similarly, uh, there is a group of folks from different uh, browser vendors, specifically Google, Apple, Microsoft, who, who are trying to come up with some sort of spec uh, which, which will itself have something called AOM, which is nothing but um, accessibility object model, which will basically have a JavaScript API which they can use um, moving away from ARIA, right? So just, just keeping a long story short, uh, the, the point here is, Instead of you having uh, to enter all those ARIA attributes or all the elements that you would develop, uh, how cool it would be um, there is a JavaScript API for you to use that 
uh, and add this uh, ARIA attributes. So something like say I have a var element is equal to document dot, dot element ID and some element, and then you can use that element object dot aria checked is equal to true. So that's simple how it's going to be, and that's just one example, and and there are a uh, few other things uh, that is still there as a part of a spec, which is going to solve most of the problems. And what is this accessibility tree? Sounds new, isn't it? Has anyone heard about it before? Mm -hmm. That's in the next slide. Very easy, isn't it? <laughs> so this accessibility tree is something that you can do right now if you have your laptops open. Um, it's behind the Chrome accessibility uh, URL. So if you have a Chrome, Google Chrome open, uh, just open up any website that you would want. And you can open a new tab and then do Chrome colon double slash accessibility. Then you will have this accessibility tree. And what this does, so to give uh, an analogy that you would understand, you know we have a web driver architecture and then we have some browser divers, which there is a server and there is a client server protocol and we use JSON wire protocol to uh, translate the web driver APIs in a way that the browser understands, right? And similarly, this accessibility tree is something that your browser provides in line with what the DOM is actually present. And the assistive devices, which is nothing but the screen readers, will interpret your UI using this. So if the screen reader doesn't know what the UI does, which is nothing but there are a few things missing in this accessibility tree. As simple as that. So put this, to put this in a neat picture for you to understand, this is how exactly it looks like. There's a HTML. And as I said, there is a DOM tree, as we all know, HTML DOM tree where we use uh, a find by element ID or XPath or CSS. And then which is actually transformed into accessibility tree, which as I said, it provides a semantic information for the assistive devices, uh, which is actually painted into a nice visual UI uh, as we all interact with. Uh, and, and which is where these assistive technologies use this accessibility tree and then um, redoed those information. So that's exactly how the web and the assistive technology work. Now, who are we talking about? So we, we miss a core point saying that, uh, okay, there is some sort of impairments in disability. You mentioned some numbers, but who are they and, and what sort of challenges they face? And is it really about only those 20% population? Well, it's actually more than that, right? So those 20% population, whatever I mentioned, is only of people with permanent impairments, right? And what about those with uh, different persona, right? So there's different persona spectrums that you can think of, like permanent, uh, situational, and temporary. So for touch, you can say uh, a permanent impairment could be someone with no one arm and someone with an arm injury and someone uh, like a new parent, just like me, um, who can have a baby in hand and then try to um, navigate your application using a keyboard. The reason why I emphasize I'm being a new parent because I was actually happened to give this accessibility talk um, back in Selenium Conference in Berlin, um, but the boy wanted to see the world uh, before the actual due date and he was born two days before the conference. So I was happened to cancel all my trip that was planned for Berlin and then um, I didn't get a chance to speak. And now I'm back here speaking about it, so good. Um, and then see, hear, and speak. So there are different aspects to it, like permanent, temporary, and situational. And this is exactly uh, taken from the Microsoft Inclusive Design Kit. So Microsoft is doing a an, an wonderful work um, uh, considering accessibility. And, and if you, if you want to take a look and learn more about it, that's again one of my references where I learn more about it. Uh, it's, it's called the Microsoft Inclusive Design Kit. It's a, it's a beautiful PDF which has all the information that you would want to know, and but, uh, especially if you're a tester and a developer, uh, want to learn you know more the, more of the coding stuff. Cool. So that's about the accessibility primer. I hope at this point um, the key takeaway was what is accessibility, and how uh, uh, it's boils down to uh, web accessibility and how the assistive device, devices interpret uh, the information is on the UI. 
And now, moving on to the second quadrant of the actual agenda, the A11Y standards, right? Of course, every, every, everyone needs some sort of standards to achieve, okay, my application is accessible. When do you say that? And that's when uh, we have the standards. It's nothing but a guidelines and protocol to make sure you're developing applications that are accessible. So there are different um, <clears throat> laws and acts um, different countries are coming up with. So these are some logo uh, to pick some. Um, ADA, Americans with Disability Act, uh, making it a law that if you're a product company or a services, um, having uh, a, a customers using your applications, and if you're not able, if, if people with disability are not able to use your applications just like the pe normal people would do, then you are entitled to get sued. And, and hence they have this law, like Americans Disability Act and Disability Discrimination Act 1992 for Australia, and Disability Discrimination Fact in UK, and there is also one for the Schengen countries, Europa um, our websites. What is it for Japanese folks here? Well, there is one. If you're wondering, do we really have in Japan as a standard? Yes, you do have. It's called the JIS X, blah, 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 some number out there, which is actually nothing but WCAG 2.0. And there's a link up there. Uh, you could go and refer what exactly are the standards that you should check for uh, to, to make sure your application is accessible that is within the Japanese law. So, talking about the standards itself, uh, given different countries have different laws and acts, um, what is the actual standard that they should achieve for? It's nothing but WCAG. Um, I'm sure probably someone have heard about it. Um, it's nothing but Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And there are different versions to it, uh, which is 1.0, 2.0, and then 2.1. So 2.0, 2.1 is very new. Uh, it's not very new, but a couple of months ago they released that, um, and which is focusing more on mobile technology, cognitive and low vision impairments. And as you see at the bottom, there is also something called Section 508, uh, which is especially for Americans. They follow a different standard, uh, which is more or less like WCAG uh, 2.0. Now, there is a standard, um, so, so we, we saw about design principles, right? Poor, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So there are design principles, and there are standards, and when I tie this together, is there a success criteria so that I know I've attained that status? If that is a question, the answer is yes. And that's what you see in the slide. It's nothing but A, AA, and AAA. A, as it's simple, it's basic. Double H deals with the most common barriers. That is where most of the companies and the countries are trying to achieve their applications to be compatible. And AAA is a, is a very um, a highest level of accessibility. And, and companies like Microsoft, Google, they're trying to invest more and more and, and come up with those ideas to attain that level of status, setting as an example. That's about standards. Um, at this stage, um, just to summarize, um, we, we spoke about accessibility and some of the design principles and saw how assistive devices interpret those applications uh, and some of the standards and success criteria, uh, how they would define uh, from a developer perspective, right? So now, the most interesting part, um, testing. What are the tools and technologies that are available uh, for you to test? A friendly disclaimer. There is no substitute for a real user feedback. You should definitely include people with disabilities to make sure you have an accessible website. What you can test? Well, there are many things that you can test, and the main ones are in the slide. You can test for focus management, are your attributes, um, computed text, form criteria, color contrast, and semantic HTML. And, and all of these can be done at different levels. Uh, there are a few things that you can do manually. And there are a few things that you can do using browser plugins. And there are a few things that you can do in an automated fashion that you can hook up into your build pipeline and making sure when you deploy your application to also be audited for these accessibility issues.
Little more detail on what exactly you can test for. You can test for keyboard accessibility, as I was mentioning earlier. Focus order. Every website has a HTML and CSS. Dot active focus is a main one that shows the focusing of, of a tab as, as you tab through your application, making sure that works. And test the functionality with assisted devices on, which is the most important again. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, you can use screen readers. Uh, uh, you, can, you can actually try that. Um, say I'm in an airline's website, or say I'm, I'm using a bank where I have to do a transaction. So what, you know what you have to do by clicking on certain buttons or, and, and doing, uh, you know, inputting a few things. But have any of you tried without using a mouse, just only um, as, with the screen reader on, with the tab focused? So just tap through and see if you can really do what you want to do. Be it airlines or be it any, any, any common things that you would want to do. I can see you're not. That's true. It's, it's, it's not quite at there, right? And that's, that's, that's the reason why we want people to embrace accessibility and, and have uh, the inclusive mindset right when they develop the UI. And test for touch target size. Yes, that is important. Um, I face this quite a lot of time because um, sometimes, I'm, I'm sure you guys would do too. So um, uh, using a mobile phone, you're in a rush, you're on the go. Open an open a, a, a app that you want to do and you try to click on a button and some things, it doesn't happen, right? On the first click and then you try to click again and then the click happens. So why this happens? Firstly, have any of you um, in that situation before? Yeah, easy, no, right? So the reason why that happens is because it's again what the developers do. They have something called the touch target. That's exactly where the point, if someone touches exactly, say, say let's take uh, uh, exactly the middle of the button. If you only click on the middle of the button, the click happens. It sends a request to the back end, right? That is right in center of the button. And sometimes in, in your hurry, if you try to click in somewhere in the right, right uh, uh, top or bottom, the click doesn't happen. That's exactly what we test for the touch target sizes. And this is very, very important for people with motor, motor impairments. So when I say motor impairments, it's nothing but people with uh, people like disabilities with, uh, say, uh, they have fat fingers, uh, uh, like people with one or two fingers who try to um, uh, click on a button, it doesn't happen. And then you can test for landmarks, headers, and semantic uh, uh, HTML information, and also for audio and video accessibility. So the next few set of slides, um, trying to uh, uh, segregate um, different, different uh, ways that we access information, the visual UI. Uh, web apps, uh, so firstly we will see how do you test accessibility for web apps, and then we will see for native mobile applications, and also share some tips about how you can test for desktop applications, which I haven't had included here. Firstly, so if you ask me, uh, how would you do for uh, screen readers? You can do JAWS, um, VoiceOver, Chrome Watch, Fangs, and different tools out there. And you can use browser plugins. Uh, it's done by X. So X is nothing but an, an accessibility engine uh, which, which has all of those WCAG 2.0 rules that can be uh, used for you to audit your application and it provides any violation that it does. Um, what you can do with Selenium, and that's the reason we are here with Selenium Conference. Um, if you can read that line of code, So it's something by doing a key stab, as I said, then scenario of tabbing uh, uh, different things that you want to do on a UI. So you can do that in an automated fashion, use an actions class, use keys.tab, and you can use the active element in the switch to constructor and get, um, uh, use the active element just like a web element and do whatever you want, like get text, click, or something. So you, you can do that in an automated fashion, just like um, uh, the one that I mentioned, uh, instead of you, um, uh, tabbing through uh, manually, you can do that in automated fashion as well. And some things that you can deep dive and do at an attribute level. Uh, are you expanded and, and, and true? And this is something, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot a point on this. So you can scope functional tests that 
navigates only via keyboard. So I was having a chat with one of my friends in Mozilla. His name is Matt Brandt. So he works for the accessibility team in Mozilla. And, and when I was exchanging some notes about how uh, accessibility works for them and what are the things that they would do. So one of the things that he mentioned that he's doing is, uh, he and his team, uh, uh, is they scope their functional tests that navigates only via the keyboard. And I think it's definitely something that we can do. And this example is something that is possible with Selenium that you can do. And there are two links uh, uh, up here which you can refer like more, more, uh, more of the uh, demo using Selenium. So just to give that a demo, this is the internet application by Dave. Uh, there is a key process. And if you go there, um, if you do anything on the keyboard, it just records that and prints it back here. And we're just doing that in an automated fashion using the code sample that I showed in the previous slide. It says I enter tab using actions class, shift and stuff. So this is a very, very basic example, but I hope you understand the point that it's still, it's doable and you can, you can take back and try this, uh, say a band transaction flow or an airlines booking flow where you can do with these tab actions and make sure, uh, say from and to destination is something that you would want to start entering and make sure the active element is on top of it and then use the send keys uh, to uh, do your next set of actions and, and see if you can achieve that. If you're able to do that, awesome. And this demo is using an Axe uh, WebDriver.js uh, plugin, um, which you can use uh, within your, uh, if you're using JavaScript, uh, this is uh, pretty straightforward to hook in. And uh, this is nothing but when your application, uh, say your test script runs, and based on the different pages that your test script visits, uh, this plugin um, just uh, audits the uh, information um, and then shows what is the, uh, some of the violations done by uh, WCAG. So npm install straightforward, and then you do npm test. So this project is actually on GitHub. It is by the, the company called DQ. They do this accessibility engine. And this application is actually an accessibility prone uh, website where it has a lot of those uh, errors. And actually it's a demonstration for common accessibility errors. And that's how the results are. It's nothing but a JSON, JSON uh, output, which can be exported and use it however they will, that you want. And just to see one of these uh, errors, you can see, okay, let's pick this. Ensures links have discernible text. What it really means, I don't know what it does. Uh, if, you're, if you're a developer in test who wants to you know, put your hands into the development aspect, you can go and fix that, right? And that's how I myself uh, right, sorry. Uh, got into a React.js development and was able to uh, fix all of these problems. Um, and this has all the information on how to fix a problem as well, all the steps that you can fix. It's quite useful. And so that's about Selenium in Java and JavaScript. Um, if someone is using Puppeteer, anyone using Puppeteer? Oh, cool. Is, is there a way to do it? Yes, there are ways using Axe uh, audits and it's something like a code sample that you can do. Cypress, how many of you use Cypress? No hands? Oh, that's one, bot, hi bot. And this is something that you can do. Um, and also that's called Axe Cypress. So this is, um, a unit testing uh, for the area attributes that you can do, um, as I showed uh, in the previous slide uh, here, that you can do in WebDriver.js. It also can be done in Cypress, uh, like actually checking for, uh, oh, they said zoomed in version. So an element should have this attribute called area label, and then you do a basic checkbox. So this is like a kind of a unit testing that people can add for their uh, accessibility unit, unit tests. If you're looking for your developers who want to do a unit testing, uh, keeping accessibility in mind. Um, Continuum, which is a BDD framework. Um, so all these tools that we saw uses the Axe um, accessibility engine, which has the audit rules, which is incorporated from the WCAG, as I mentioned earlier. So this specific tool uses a different engine 
uh, which is called the level access engine, uh, which you can use just like this. If you're using a BDD framework and I want to include this, this is a way you can do it. Um, moving on to Android apps. It's quite easy. Um, Espresso, if you're using Espresso, um, it's, it's as simple and straightforward that you use accessibility, accessibility checks.enable and it will uh, audit uh, a particular view that is opened by your automation and then uh, you can, it will actually have the results for your app. And RoboElectric, uh, which, which happened to be quite new when I did some research for this presentation. And how many of you heard this RoboElectric before? Ah, oh, cool, Matt. Um, so RoboElectric is, is something like um, uh, a, an emulator that is um, uh, within a JVM itself, so it's quite fast. If you have unit tests that you want to kick off uh, without uh, consuming more of the resources, you can use RoboElectric and still be able to do an accessibility check and it's more simple than Espresso. If you just have this annotation enabled at, at the rate of accessibility checks, you will have your accessibility audits done. On-screen evaluation. Uh, I am no technical expert. I don't know coding. Is there still, for me, a way to do? Or you're helping your business analyst do some sort of accessibility checks. Is that a way to do it? The answer is yes. Um, sorry, Apple users. So this is for Android. Um, Play Store, accessibility scanner. You have an app. You can use, you can enable accessibility scanner and open up any app that you would want. And it usually has a button in the center of the screen. Click on it, and it will give you an accessibility audit for that particular uh, screen. Like say in this screen that the text contrast is not proper. Uh, someone who has a color blindness is viewing something on the application uh, will have difficulties in reading what the text does. Ah, this is very interesting. So one of the banks that I am a customer of, um, uh, based in Australia, um, anyone can guess what it is? How I could end up with something like this? Last one. Oh, you know the answer. <laughs> so it is. The answer is already out. So on your mobile phones, be it iOS or Android, on your settings, drag all the way up to your font and display sizes, like very extra large and open up your app that you usually do and still see if you're able to interact with these elements. So I did this for my bank that I'm a customer of and I was not able to click on this login, log on button. There's a huge accessibility defect which boils down to a visual issue or also the touch target issue that I spoke about earlier. And how you can validate? Can you use any of the visual testing platforms? like capital tools, and test, test for those uh, visual issues. For iOS apps, what is it in for iOS apps? Uh, well, before talking about this, um, iOS Apple devices are usually uh, very strict in terms of um, ham, uh, shipping your apps to your uh, iStore, Apple Store. Um, uh, they have uh, all the accessibility APIs pretty much uh, out there and, and you can use unit testing to uh, uh, test those. And there is one from Google, as you see in the screen, which is called the GTX iLib. Uh, can be, it can be used with any XE test framework like Earl Grey um, and you can uh, do the accessibility audits from there. And especially for iOS platforms. So that's about the tools and testing strategy. Uh, I really have to skim through on this because um, uh, I have also um, heard, heard about uh, people want to learn about accessibility, but also want to keep it uh, 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 very basic so that you understand what accessibility is and what are those principles, and also cover some of the technical aspects. And I have to balance it between those in the slides, and I think I've done that. Uh, if you have more questions about specific unit tests or, or uh, uh, how to do it in specific scenarios or different frameworks and tools that I haven't shown here, come and speak to me and I'll be able to help you with that. Uh, moving on to strategy, uh, how you can take back this uh, accessibility uh, in, in your organizations um, as a key takeaway. Um, involve people with disabilities for sure. And this is something that worked for me really well. Um, establish a benchmark, create a checklist, 
Um, start right from the UX design. Don't keep it late until your UI is ready. Uh, possibly have something like a global experience language where uh, most of the companies does that now, that they have all the components ready, like a centralized team who only work on the UI components, and then uh, different teams, different portfolios within the company try to use those components and, and use it from there. And con of course, conduct usability and user testing sessions outside the organization, which is still very important. Uh, finally, some departing thoughts before I finish my talk. Uh, this, is, this is very good, and I would encourage everyone to go register yourself if you want to uh, help people uh, with low vision. Uh, this is called Be My Eyes. It is available for both Android and iOS. Uh, I'm one of the registered volunteers there. Um, so this is something that people who has no vision but still want some help, they can directly reach out to you if they are near to you, of course. It works based on maps and all that stuff. Because, of course, we are in a situation like, oh, I know, I kind of know that person is blind, but does that person really need a help? You really don't know. But that's where this app bridges the communication between those people and us, and we can help them. Go register yourself. Some references are dq.com. You can go back and check it out. Um, WICG, um, uh, that's the uh, AOM that I spoke about. Uh, and a YouTube link that you can watch uh, from the Google I.O. keynote um, that the uh, Google Accessibility team spoke about. And thank you. Thank you for listening. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Manoj. Oh, oh sorry. I'm here. <laughs> so if you have uh, any question, please raise your hand. We have, oh. You have a translation with Shiba. Ah, okay. Maybe he's English. Hopefully. Hi. Uh, great talk. Sorry, one second. Um, sure. I just have a message from my colleague. So the best questions asked will get a gift um, from Apple Tools that is right up here. And I'll be happy to hand over. Please. Okay. Yeah, so previously I've done accessibility testing on a mobile app and say one of the common features on mobile these days would be an infinity um, carousel view, so where the last element returns back to the first one. And by just doing a standard audit, we didn't pick that up in the accessibility testing, but actually going through and doing that as a UI accessibility test, we managed to pick up that it was just infinite looping around those elements in the carousel and never quite getting to the buttons afterwards to accept the results. Have you had any other kind of scenarios like that where? Um, that's really a good question. Um, um, so I've, I've done that like before for web applications, like having an infinite loop. I actually had a demo, but I didn't run because we are a little short of time and I can show you uh, how to do that. For mobile applications, the common um, errors that I've seen, uh, actually working with a bank in Australia uh, with a team uh, here is here, and I'd be happy to connect with them. I can see them uh, right there. Um, uh, the common effects like color contrast, um, uh, not able to have the focus right back in the element. Say there is a, there is a different layers. So you have a native app. And there is a different uh, uh, a window coming on top of it. It's called the layers in the mobile language. And what happens if you click on that top layer, does the focus go back to the uh, original layer so that the user would still be able to continue with that flow? So most of the places uh, uh, the issues occurs there is, is where it, it wouldn't go back to the uh, uh, time where it is. So that is one thing. And color contrast, of course, yes. And, and especially the large text that I showed you. That's the most important one, uh, uh, where um, especially if you see uh, there is certain uh, a limit, a limit that has been given where the UI will be at only this list. And if you enable large text, it should actually fit well, well fit in within that space. If not, uh, then you will, of course, have difficulties in clicking on it. So those are the common things that I've seen. And, and of course, we can talk more about it with different tools. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if any, any other one. Have a question? We can accept just one more question. More questions? Yeah. Oh, this one, yeah. yeah. It's not really a technical question, but more of a 
kind of philosophical question in a company because we have reported accessibility bugs, we have tried automation on it, but it's kind of really difficult to get the product owners to care about it because they're really money oriented. <laughs> so do you have any strategy, not technical, but like people and how to influence your product owners to actually care about accessibility rather than just pointing out to a law, but how to approach them in a more humane way and make them care? That's a really wonderful question, actually, because I was exactly in that position, and I'm happy that I can answer, and that's why I was smiling when you had that question. Um, so the insurance company that I work for back in Australia had the same problem. Um, of course, as you rightly said, product owners and business owners, business analysts, they have everything in business in mind, but leaving out something about, you know, not, not seeing the ways being more inclusive. So the way that we tackle their uh, or, or solution, we, we, we got their interest, was to do some user testing. Right? So we got some external people with actual disabilities, so we, we gave them a special room and we had an, uh, a webcam on top of the monitor to see what their reactions are and how they interact with the web, web applications and see if they really be able to use it. Right? And if they're not able to use it, then of course you're losing out your business. Because 20% population in the world is still huge and it could yield a, a lot of a business for you. And, and to quote an instance, that it has happened to be a, a lawsuit that was filed against Coles in Australia, uh, where uh, one of, one of uh, the customer who was using Coles was not able to purchase something on the website. And then it, it happened to be a, a lawsuit as per the Australian Disability Act, where they filed a lawsuit, and I think it was sued for about one million or something. So it, there are a few instances that you can quote them and do an, an interactive user accessibility testing, record sessions, see how they do it, and take that back to your business and make sure they get more interest towards it. Thank you so much. Cheers. Okay, now it's time to finish. Finish? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.